Our speaker today is Dr. Lainey Ross, who will speak on the topic of pediatric transplantation, donors and recipients. Uh, Dr. Ross uh, needs no introduction, uh, but that doesn't mean I won't give you one. Um, uh, Dr. Ross is the Carolyn and Matthew Buxbaum uh, Professor, uh, the Associate Director of the McLean Center, uh, and a professor in pediatrics, medicine, surgery, and in the college. Uh, Dr. Ross also serves as the co-director of the Institute uh, of Translational Medicine here at the university. Uh, her training was medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, residency at CHOP in Columbia, uh, and then uh, she wrote her PhD at Yale, PhD in philosophy uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, many of you have worked with Dr. Ross and you know her extraordinary capabilities as a mentor and teacher. Um, she serves on the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protection and on the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Bioethics Executive Committee as its chair. Um, it's a great delight to invite and welcome Lainey to give today's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanted to begin with two things. First, to acknowledge the three, uh, two students and Dr. Thistlethwaite who worked with me on this project. I don't know if Chris or, or Will were able to get out of their clinical responsibilities. Um, and I wanted to start though with a question. So in kidney transplantation, are there more pediatric recipients or pediatric donors? So how many of you think that kids, in a sense, take more than they give or do they give more than they take? So how many think there are more pediatric recipients? And how many think there are more pediatric donors? So we're sort of evenly split. And here's the answer. In 2011, there were 843 pediatric deceased donor kidneys, making up 11% of all deceased donors. There were 454 pediatric deceased kidney recipients, making up 4% of recipients. Hence, the reason to discuss pediatric deceased donor allocation issues from both perspectives. Just for those interested, there were zero pediatric living kidney donors. That has not always been the case. And there were 302 uh, children who received uh, kidneys from living donors. So here are my four objectives to discuss the policy issues raised by giving minors special priority in deceased donor solid organ transplants and then to discuss the ethical and policy issues related to elective deceased donor transplants in minors. And then uh, with regards to pediatric solid organ donors, I'm going to really talk about allocation issues with pediatric deceased donor organs. I doubt we're going to have time for me to talk about the whole issue of whether children should ever serve as solid living organ donors. So I'm probably just going to focus on these three. So let me begin first with pediatric recipients. So the first question is, should children be given priority for deceased donors um, and then priority for early allocation and priority for the best quality organs? And so a policy was written in October 2005 that uh, UNOS implemented, which basically said that uh, all renal allografts from young deceased donors less than 35 years of age would be given preferentially to local pediatric patients less than 18 years. Um, although if a, local if a local suitable pediatric candidate couldn't be found, the organ would be offered to a local adult candidate. And the policy was intended to reduce waiting times for pediatric candidates and allocating ideal deceased donor kidneys to them. Now I should begin with my real bias, right? I'm a pediatrician, so I'm always wanting to get the best for kids. So clearly I was in favor of a policy that was going to do that. And there are actually clinical reasons to justify my bias. One is that children don't grow and develop appropriately on dialysis, so that if they're in chronic renal failure, they really do need transplant, uh, kidney transplant. Um, but why 35? Why did they pick the age of any deceased donor under the age of 35? And here I have a graph which shows you that the quality of kidneys um, from donors over the age of 35 are much, you know, have a longer, uh, have a worse. Uh, graph survival as time goes on, and clearly kids are going to need uh, kidneys that are going to last for decades. And so it makes sense to give them kidneys that are going to, um, to last as long as possible so that we don't have to start talking about retransplanting them in their 20s, but maybe in their 30s or 40s. Um, I also just wanted to point out the impact of SHARE 35. So before we had this rule, what you saw was that kids were getting uh, kidneys from everywhere. And in fact, they, if you just look under the base, so up to here, 
um, they were getting what we now call ideal donors, but they were actually getting a large number of uh, kidneys from people 35 to 49 and even some of the older donors from 50 and up. And now under the new policy, you notice two things. One is they got more kidneys in the, in, in the same five-year time period, but also that virtually all of the kidneys they got were from donors under the age of 35. The yellow representing a small number of deceased donors from 35 to 49-year-olds. Uh, and these may be uh, individuals, uh, for example, who had high sensitization and therefore weren't able to match easily to a kidney. So the policy did what it wanted. It gave the best kidneys and it gave more kidneys to children. Um, and here, in fact, if you look, is another way of seeing this data. And what we did here was look at time from waitlist registration. And again, if you look, um, you're going to see two things. So 2002 was just a year we picked that was going to be uh, pre-share 35 and 2007 post-share 35. And what you will see is that within six months uh, after share 45, only 43% of the uh, children who had been waitlisted were still waiting and that it was down to only t a quarter by one year versus there was still a third waiting for kidneys pre-share 35. So again, they were getting them more quickly. But you're also going to notice one other change though which is that um, here when you see wh where they got kidneys from, the children in 2002 got 301 of their kidneys in the first six months from deceased donors and got 83 or about a quarter of them from living donors. And here in 2007, they got 278 transplants and uh, 86 from living donors. But overall, in the end, for the living donors in 2007, they, they look like the same, um, they're actually pretty equivalent in the number of numbers. So not too much of a fall in 2007 um, in the number of living donors. But that's act I also wanted to show, though, some of the unintended consequences of Share 35. And there is actually um, a relative drop in the number of parents who, start, uh, who continue to donate to their children. And in part, you might say, why is this? And, and the answer is, um, if I'm promised a great deceased donor before, within one year, um, I might as well save my kidney for when my child needs to be retransplanted. This was not anticipated at the time of writing the deceased donor policy for Share 35. And why this becomes a problem is um, this becomes a problem because there are two concerns. One, if kids are taking more deceased donor kidneys and taking the best kidneys, then it, as there's less kidneys for adults, then adults are going to have to start looking for living donors. And in a sense, if you ask me, would I rather a 15-year-old get a living donor or a 65-year-old get a living donor, the answer is clearly I want the 15-year-old because, again, those are the ideal donors. They're going to last even longer than the best deceased donor, and so it will reduce the need for retransplant. But from a parent's perspective, you can see why they might go the opposite way and think to themselves, when they need a retransplant, they're not going to have priority, so let me save my kidney for that time. And that's what happened. And this is important because as we're talking about new kidney allocation policies um, currently in the United States, there's this move to give the best kidneys, not just to kids under 18, but to really give some of the best kidneys to even young adults up to 30 or 35. Um, and what that might do is decrease the number of living donors overall. 75% of all transplants in uh, young adults under the age of 30 come from living donors. And uh, so either we're going to have less overall number of kidneys because the living donors are going to stop donating, or we're going to be transferring those living donors to older people who might not otherwise get a deceased donor, and that would be quite inefficient. But one question is, is it working? In the sense, are, are there graphs surviving as long as we had hoped? And I just want to point out this one piece of data, which shows that um, the one-year and five-year allograft survival among recipients of kidney transplants from ideal donors. And what you're going to see here is that um, the number of grafts functioning um, at five years really plummets in that adolescent to young adult group. So as we give them better kidneys, they're not doing so well with it. And the reason is, is because they are the least compliant with their immunosuppression. And so, in a sense, are we really getting the efficiency that was hoped for? And in fact, uh, in this article by Levine et al., this is the quote, the allocation of ideal donors to adolescent recipients may not maximize graph utility, reevaluation of pediatric allocation priority, may offer opportunities to optimize ideal renal allograft survival. So there's at least some people who are trying to push back on the grounds of uh, poor compliance.
Again, my bias being a pediatrician is that clearly I support Chair 35, but I think we have to acknowledge um, some of the issues and uh, acknowledge the unintended consequences of reducing living donors. And part of this is we have to remember that UNOS controls, um, allocates deceased donors, but in a sense, as a living donor, you get to choose who you're going to give to. And so the more um, we give priority to young, both children, but also young adults of living donors, we may actually reduce the number of living donors overall. Um, or change it to be giving it to older people who really don't need a kidney that will last them for 25 or 30 years. So I just, as I said, the, the point of this whole part was to really think about the unintended consequences, that as we, uh, as we uh, give all these donors, we're going to decrease the number of living donors. The next part of the talk, then, is to look at something that very few people think about, which is this notion of elective organ transplantation in children. So what is an elective transplant? It's the practice of offering an organ transplant when an alternative procedure exists. And there are two good examples in the literature. One is hypoplastic left heart, where children can undergo a three-stage Norwood procedure. And the other, or they can get a heart transplant. And the data, mostly from Alex Kahn, shows that people are offered usually one or the other, depending on the site where their child happens to be born and diagnosed. Um, and yet their results in morbidity and mortality are actually quite similar. Another place where we have elective transplants, and the one I want to talk about today, is in liver transplant, where some children with metabolic conditions, for example, maple syrup urine disease, they can be treated by dietary means or liver transplant. Uh, the, the problem with the dietary means is that if they have an event, uh, it can be quite catastrophic from which they may not recover, particularly cognitively. And so in some ways, the liver transplant reduces the fear of um, a protein overload in these children. And uh, this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue as we continue to expand living, uh, newborn screening because we're going to be picking up more children asymptomatically with some of these conditions who may be, in a sense, the ideal transplant candidate. Um, so the procedure is elective. Uh, and we can debate whether, whether we're talking about in hypoplastic left heart or maple syrup urine disease, whether the alternative treatment or the transplant is better. But the point of calling it elective is that there are some children who need a heart transplant or a liver transplant who don't have an alternative, right? So they're going to die on the wait list while we're going to give some priority to these children. And we need to ask ourselves, is this fair? And as I pointed out, though, at this point, Norwood's equivalent. Um, the data are still coming in about which is better from an individual child's perspective, a liver transplant or dietary treatment for maple syrup urine disease. Um, so traditionally, this is the way we treated children with maple syrup urine disease um, in order to uh, preserve normal function of the CNS. In an ill newborn, ECMO may be necessary, and then lifelong dietary restrictions to uh, maintain blood me metabolic uh, concentrations close to normal. And throughout life, there's aggressive interventions every time they have an illness in order to rapidly reverse any metabolic derangements. But the real concern then is that these kids can stroke out if, if not aggressive enough. Um, and so despite aggressive treatment, despite knowing how to take care of these kids, uh, many kids with classic maple syrup urine disease have a poor intellectual outcome, sometimes because of delay in diagnosis, sometimes delay in starting treatment, sometimes because of acute metabolic derangement, and uh, that their metabolic control tends to deteriorate with age. So what are the outcomes with liver transplant and maple syrup urine disease? It's interesting that the first report actually was, um, it was done sort of accidentally. So there was a seven and a half year old French gypsy girl with maple syrup urine disease and terminal liver failure um, caused by hepatitis A viral infection. And she got a liver transplant and um, but both did quite well from the hepatitis perspective, but also, um, in a sense, cured her maple syrup urine disease. And after that, there was another um, decision then made to actually transplant a two-year-old Spanish boy who had frequent metabolic decompensations. And in 1997, there was a two-year-old girl here in the United States who had a vitamin A intoxication. Her parents had given her overdose of vitamin A, thinking this would help treat her liver problems. Um, and so, again, not only treat... Uh, 
reversing the vitamin A problems, but also curing her maple syrup urine disease. And it was because of several of these case studies that Strauss et al. Um, at the special clinic in, uh, in the uh, Amish community out in Pennsylvania, worked with the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh to actually put these children on, a, uh, on, the, kidney, on the liver transplant wait list at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, they were able to actually argue for uh, high prioritization due to the neurologic burden of the disease, particularly if there's decompensation. And um, as one would imagine, is that patients with hepatic-based metabolic disorders will do really well with a liver transplant. One, it reduces their acute metabolic decompensation, but it's also that they're, they're very healthy in general when they go into um, having a, the liver transplant. So at the uh, Clinic for Special Children, as I mentioned, they did it, and they actually looked at it from a cost perspective, because this is the Amish community, which doesn't have health insurance, but pays in cash for their health care. And they came to realize that it was actually uh, financial, not only just from a medical perspective, but they also thought that economically it was saving in order to have a liver transplant. And part of their argument about that was they looked at the number of hospitalizations for acute metabolic decompensations um, for, for, for their children. So what's the obstacle to performing liver transplants in all patients with maple syrup urine disease? And part of the issue is going to be the scarcity, and the fact is that they have an alternative treatment, and we're going to have to ask ourselves whether it makes sense to be giving people transplants when they have another alternative. I point this out um, for, because the year 2001 has two interesting facts that happen. One is, and this is for all living donor liver transplants for both adults and children, and you'll see that in 2001, we have 524 living donors, and the numbers, in a sense, decrease thereafter and, have still, not, and still haven't recovered and probably never will. And um, you'll also notice that in 2001, we, had, we peaked in the number of deaths, and the number of deaths have been going down since 2001. And there are two facts that happened in the year 2001. The first was the death of a living donor, Mike Hurwitz, which really put a damper on the whole issue of doing adult-to-adult -adult living donor. The reason for the decrease in the wait list was also a change in the liver allocation policy into something called MELD and PELD. Um, and as you can see, it's actually been quite effective, even though the number of uh, livers that are available really hasn't changed over the time, the number dying on the wait list. Nevertheless, um, People with metabolic disease would have very low PELD scores and so wouldn't be eligible, and yet there are reasons that you can go to a region um, to ask for exceptions, and metabolic diseases have been considered one of those exceptions, so that they would be eligible for rather high priority in giving a liver transplant. Um, so looking at the UNOS data, uh, looking at who gets a deceased donor liver transplant, what you can see is, just to give you an idea from data from last month, is that the total being waitlisted uh, for children under the age of one is only 38 children, uh, and actually a pretty small number overall uh, for all children. You can see that um, the number of children who received deceased donor liver transplants in, uh, in 2012, um, a pretty large number. The number who received living donor transplants and again, as I said, um, uh, actually, it's smaller than I would have thought. So only 40 of the uh, transplants of living donor were, were in pediatrics. Um, but you could also see the total number who died in 2012 while waiting on the liver transplant. So it's this group, in a sense, that there are 12 dying on the transplant. And if we're going to have you know, a dozen or so children every year born with maple syrup urine disease around the country, the question is, uh, should they get priority when other children are dying on the, on the uh, wait list? Uh, but so you have this issue because from the particular child's perspective, it's probably better to get a transplant than dietary management. Although, as I said, the data aren't fully in yet. Um, and in our Western bioethics approach, we think of it as our obligation to the individual patient, which would then suggest that we should be offering liver transplants to these individuals and that if offered, it will probably be accepted. But one could imagine a community deciding, you know what, there is an alternative, and the alternative is dietary, and, uh, and basically saying that we're not going to be uh, transplanting children with metabolic conditions unless, in a sense, they have a living donor. Um, I a actually don't support that, but I do think we need to think about what our policies are going to look like 
as we increase the number of metabolic conditions that we're going to be identifying in early childhood through newborn screening, that this issue is not going to get smaller, but it's going to grow, and it's going to require that uh, UNOS come up with policies about thinking what type of priority, if any, that they want to give these children. So those are two issues about children being uh, organ recipients. I now want to look at pediatric donors. Uh, depending on the time, I'm probably only going to focus on children as deceased donors, but if there's time, we can also talk about when, if ever, should children serve as living donors. So starting with allocating pediatric deceased donor kidneys. So currently, as I showed, it represents over 10% of the total supply of U.S. deceased donor kidneys. 90% of pediatric donor kidneys actually go into adult recipients. The majority are aged 35 to 49. And in fact, a third of these kidneys are transplanted into adults over the age of 50. So um, pediatric deceased donor kidneys are actually uh, quite important. And so one question, is this a good use of pediatric deceased donor kidneys? Does it make sense to be putting in these small kidneys into, into larger individuals? So just to give you an idea, um, giving you a graph from over 10 years data, um, and I see Will Parker made it, and he's the one who actually made this graph. What you can see is then, so these are all pediatric uh, kidneys from different ages, 0, 1 to 5. Um, this means single kidney transplant. These mean on block, and we'll be talking about that. So this is giving to an adult a, ki a single kidney from a 1 to 5-year-old versus giving them both kidneys from the same donor. 6 to 9 and 10 to 17 year old and as you can see there are a lot of kidneys being pediatric kidneys being transplanted into adults with the majority in the 35 to 49 year old range so are all pedi pe fact one all pediatric kidneys are not the same and what i want to focus on for right now is the case of the very young donor so those less than or equal to five years of age um, and here is a, an important graph which shows um, looking just at uh, one, two, and three-year-old kidneys and their graft survival over time versus the zero-year-old kidneys. So clearly the one, two, and three-year-old do pretty similarly and do much better than a kidney from a donor less than the age of one year. Um, the next fact is that very young donors, as I've mentioned, can either be uh, allocated as single kidneys or on block. And um, as you can see, here is uh, donors up to the age of five. Um, and the green is the number of kidneys that are transplanted on block, and the purple are the number that are uh, transplanted as a single kidney. And so as we get older and as their children's weight get higher, you see that it becomes more common to do a single kidney transplant. But does it make sense to be doing all of these kidneys as an on-block procedure? And so here's our data looking at, again, with the zero kidneys doing worse, but what you can see here is that the 10 to 17 year old kidneys, which are really considered the ideal kidneys, they look sort of like the 18 to 35 year old, those ideal deceased donor kidneys. What you see is the one to five year old on block kidneys have a little bit of a problem right at the start in, in working, but once they start working, their long term outcomes are as good as a 10 to 17 year old kidney. Um, the six, um, and compare that though to the single kidney, which does approximately uh, 10 percentage points uh, worse over five years. But here's the problem. So I acknowledge that um, given the choice, everybody would want a one to five year old on block kidney. But if we can save two lives um, with the first life having just a 10% lower five year survival, does it make sense to be giving both kidneys to one individual or should we be splitting them um, always? And we'll ignore the under one age kidneys because on block and uh, single they do much poorer than all the others. Um, so historically, uh, I, we think that it's important not just to look at how do z one to five year old kidneys do, but to really look at the difference between on block versus single, because those on block kidneys really do as well as the ideal donors. And to actually split out the zeros, because when transplant surgeons see the data from young children under the age of five, it looks much worse because you're, you're adding on those zero-year-old donors who we know are actually quite different than all the other deceased donors under the age of five. Um, and so here it compares all the pediatric kidneys, again, to the ideal adult donors. And what you see is here is the, um, the, the pediatric kidneys. Um, and here is... Why am I not seeing my 18 to 34-year-old donors? Because the lines totally overlap. 
So this is actually where you find the 18 to 34 year old donors and the 10 to 17 year old donors. And again, the one to five year old is slightly worse. And as you can see, here are some of the pediatric kidneys. They actually do a lot better than the 50 to 59 year old and the 60 plus donors. Um, and the, eight, and the uh, 35 to 49 year olds doing as well as all of the other pediatric kidneys, including the, the 35 to 49 year old donors which is the red looking quite similar to the green line, which are those single kidneys from one to five year olds. So really questioning whether we can justify giving these kidneys out on block. So, um, so by allocating kidneys from donors age one to five on block, the total life years gained by the system goes down, right? Um, they have somewhere between, as I said, a seven to 10 percent decrease five year survival overall. Um, so one question is, well, with SHARE 35, shouldn't we just give all pediatric recipients on block kidneys from donors less than the age of five years? And one of the things you saw from the data is most pediatric donors do not go to pediatric recipients. And so given that, um, since we're giving lots of adult 35 to 49 year old kidneys and these single one to five year old kidneys look the same, it might make sense for us to be dividing many more of them and at least increasing the, the number of transplants that can be done. In fact, of the 1,122 on block kidneys done over the decade, only 52 of them went to uh, pediatric recipients. Now, the uh, zero year old kidneys do, do much poorer, and so I don't think the arguments about on block and single really hold for them. Um, currently, the decision on how to pure, procure kidneys, so how you take it out of a deceased donor, is left to the transplant team. In neurotransplant, it's required, for example, that procurement occurs on block for, for donors under the age of two. For donors between the ages of two and five, it can be um, recommended that procurement occurs on block. That doesn't say how it's allocated. Even if it's procured on block, you can still allocate them singly. Um, but um, it may be better to determine allocation as single kidney transplants versus on block based on weight rather than age is one concern, but also just the whole concern of whether it makes sense to be doing on blocks at all. Fact three about deceased donor kidneys is that these donors less than one year are virtually all transplanted on block, and yet they still do substantially worse, right? And so um, part of their problem is really that they just have a high 100-day risk of graft failure. But ultimately, they start to perform as well as organs from candidates over the age of 50, which compares in the kidney world to those kidneys that are currently labeled extended criteria donors. Um, and in fact, this is a comparative graph which looks at just the 100-day survival. And as you can see, the ideal donors, which are 18 to 34, and that the 10 to 17-year-olds look exactly the same, both at 100 days and at five-year survival. Those one to five on blocks, 2% lower in the first 100 days, so they have a slightly uh, increased graft failure right at the beginning, but look exactly the same at five years. Um, and so um, they might be almost too good to be giving out on block, right? And then when you look at the other children, slightly uh, uh, poorer in their five-year survival compared to the ideal kidneys. The one to five single kidney, um, again, slightly poorer of, uh, first 100 days, but looking just like a 35 to 49 year old kidney donor. And most people would think that's a pretty good deal if they got a 35 to 49 year old healthy uh, deceased donor. Uh, with the zero year olds looking more like their older uh, compatriots from the age of 50 and uh, 60 plus. So this is the interesting thing, which is um, it depends what type of better you are. Because so the, the dotted gray line is the uh, 50 to 59 year olds, which clearly do better than either the, uh, the zero year old donors, um, for at least at the beginning, um, and clearly do better than the 60 year old donors. But the, the betting question is, right, so they do really poorly in the first 100 days, but after that, they're actually better than many of our extended criteria donors. So the question would be, you know, now knowing the data, if offered, and if you, um, if offered, and particularly the, the typical individual accepting an extended criteria donor is going to be someone over the age of 60, um, which do you take? Do you bet on the short-term issues or do you go for the long-term? Um, and so I think it actually raises some interesting issues that haven't yet been addressed in the literature. So um, 
just a, a you know food for thought which would you prefer given the fact that you know that you'll have a uh, a bigger risk up front if you take the uh, zero year old kidney but in the long term it may turn out to be better so to conclude for this part of the talk um, Share 35 refers to all kidneys from donors younger than 35 years of age. But what the transplant surgeon needs to know, and they, they already know, that um, you know, zero-year-old kidneys have a high risk of early failure, and there are very few programs that probably accept a zero-year-old kidney. And yet we may need to be rethinking that, particularly for recipients who are older. Um, the 1 to 5 block performs similarly to the best adult kidneys, probably should be split to maximize the number of candidates who receive kidneys. Um, and then if split, the surgeon should consider, though, whether they want to use it as a minor because all of a sudden those kidneys are no longer as good as the most ideal kidneys, but more similar to the 35 to 49-year-old, and we might want to leave those kidneys to the adults. I did tell you I had a pediatric bias. Um, and finally, that allocation that assumes that kidney function improves literally over the pediatric age range is are wrong. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that you know says they're trying to design these new allocation systems that pediatric kidneys are linearly improved. And, and uh, I think what we've shown, first of all, is that on block does a lot better than single kidneys, number one. But number two, that the zeros are so much worse that they often weigh down if you can include them in the zero to five-year-old block. So um, the minor is a transplant recipient. Clearly, I think that minors get and should get priority in deceased organ transplants. But we need to acknowledge the unintended consequences of this policy, and we need to figure out how to improve compliance so that they really are useful. Um, and we also need to develop better guidelines and be realistic about these elective transplants as they are going to increase over time. So uh, we should all be willing to serve, clearly, the minor as a transplant deceased donor. We all should be willing to serve as deceased organ donors, or our parents should be willing to give permission for us to serve if we're minors. Um, who should be living donors? I threatened was going to be a separate talk, but given that I, I'm a New Yorker and talk so quickly, I'm actually going to be able to cover it, and I'm glad. So I'm going to skip over two slides, my conclusions, and keep going. Um, the data about the quality of pediatric uh, donors, though, needs further evaluation, and uh, Dick, Will, and Chris and I are, are working on some papers in this regard, and it may change what we mean by uh, SHARE 35. It may require guidelines about what kidneys should be allocated on block. Um, but as I always say, as I'm trying to conclude, I'd be remiss if I did not mention that prevention of kidney disease actually must begin in childhood, right? Our obesity epidemic is just waiting to happen as these adults go into kidney failure. So we need to reduce obesity. We need to do better control of our children in diabetes and high blood pressure. So I'm going to skip that I claimed that I was going to end. And I'm going to go to the fourth point, which is do children serve as living donors and should they? So... The fact is, is uh, in the last 15 years, at least 60 children have served as living donors. Um, in 2005, the Amsterdam Consensus Panel said, no, they never should. A statement in the U.S. in 2000 actually said, yes, under certain conditions. And the UNOS policy under developments in 2008 said that age less than 18 is a relative contraindication, but did not uh, exclude it totally. Now, the data I showed showed zero donors from this past year. If you look, actually, in 2012, there's at least one minor who donated a kidney as a living donor. And so um, I was asked by the American Academy of Pediatrics to write a statement on giving guidelines of when, if ever, should minors serve as living donors. And this statement was written by the AAP Committee on Bioethics with both uh, Dick Thistlethwaite and myself as the lead authors. So the, um, it's important because we actually base most of our recommended uh, recommendations on the U.S. Live Organ Donor Consensus Group from 2000. And uh, they had four recommendations that the donor and recipient are both highly likely to benefit, that it didn't make sense to be letting a child serve as a living donor unless you thought that the recipient had a high likelihood of, of doing well. They also wanted to make sure that the surgical risk for the donor is extremely low. Um, so I think what we're really talking about is children serving as kidney donors, although, again, if you look internationally at the data, Children have served not only as kidney donors, but they have served as living liver donors. They have sold, uh, served as intestinal uh, donors. The third point was that all other deceased and living donor options have been exhausted. So we shouldn't be looking at children to serve as uh, kidney donors if they have healthy enough parents um, or healthy enough other uh, first-degree type relatives. And uh, there was an importance to at least give the child some degree of assent 
um, uh, to, uh, to donate without coercion. And here it was recommended at the time to have an independent advocate. Living donor advocates have become commonplace now for both pediatric and adult, but at that time in 2000, this was not a very common practice. For the AAP, we added a fifth criteria, which were not only to focus on that the surgical risks be low, but that the emotional and psychological risks to the donor not only be low, but also be minimized. Um, the data that we were looking at to, to think about this point really came from the uh, bone marrow transplant literature. Um, and, and that literature where uh, minors frequently serve as stem cell donors to siblings, in part because they have the greatest likelihood of being 100% histocompatible. Uh, the data there are uh, somewhat or sometimes distressing, particularly when a recipient does poorly, that many children blame themselves uh, rather than understand that it was their sibling's illness for which the, the uh, recipient died. So um, the interesting thing is, one question is, should we allow living donor transplant between identical twins, right? Because genetically the same, and the big benefit there is you don't need immunosuppression. And so people ask questions about the emotional closeness and the data go in both directions. Sometimes uh, identical twins are the best of friends and sometimes they actually hate each other, right? Uh, but this is, the big significant benefit is the immunological benefit. And so one question though isn't to just look at the benefit. Given that all the guidelines are focusing on minimizing surgical risk, minimizing psychological and emotional risk, um, the question is, um, um, to the extent that we believe that being a living donor as a child may put you at long-term health risks, should we allow greater risk-taking between identical twins? And as I say, some just do it as a cost-benefit analysis and say, well, the benefit's greater, so the risk can be greater. Um, and some say no, because the risk to the donor remain the same. Um, and uh, so the question was, should this allow for donors at younger age? And Dick and I were very much against it, but I should tell you that um, the American Academy of Pediatrics Board of Directors wanted us to treat identical twins differently. They felt that there was such a big immunological benefit that we should be allowing transplants between identical twins. So one of the ways of dealing with the board was to get a student involved and do a study. So this was a study done uh, with Josh Joseph, who is now um, an emergency medicine doctor at, at Mass General. Um, and what we did was we looked at 400 members of the American Society of Transplant and the uh, 160 members of the American Academy of Pediatrics just because of the small sizes of these uh, groups. There were 80 members in the section on bioethics and 80 members in the section on nephrology. And uh, we gave them a survey where we asked them about 15-year-old twins, one of whom has recently developed acute glomerular nephritis, has begun dialysis and needs a kidney transplant. The physicians were told that the patient had been placed on C stone wait list and would likely receive a kidney within the year due to her age. The physicians were also told that her parents, who are both diabetic, had inquired about serving as living donors but were ruled ineligible, and that in response, her healthy twin asked whether she could serve as a living donor. And so we gave a couple of scenarios. Was donation by the twin sibling appropriate in this scenario? Would donation by the twin sibling be appropriate if the wait for deceased donor was six years rather than one year? Would donation by the twin sibling be appropriate if the ten, twins were 10 rather than 15? Did it matter whether the twins were fraternal or identical? And what if these were your own children? So those are the questions that the docs were going to be asked. 560 surveys were distributed. 49 physicians were excluded because they couldn't be located. Another 75 excluded themselves, saying that they either weren't practicing or these questions were outside of their area of expertise. So of the remaining 436 recipients, we had a 39% uh, response rate. And what you see, actually, is that the, uh, there was a 37 response rate by the American Society of Transplant, a 43% response rate by the m members of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And here were our data. Um, and in, in part, we're not going to get a lot of statistical significance due to the small size. But what you can see is that overall, looking at fraternal twins, to looking at identical twins, the numbers go up approximately 8 to 10 percent for every question, whether it's about a one-year wait or a, five, a, a one-year wait in a fraternal versus a one-year wait in identical, whether there's a six-year wait, um, and it continues to go up. And noticeably, that more were willing to, tr to have their own child serve as a living donor in each scenario, 
more than they thought it was appropriate for the AAP to have such a policy. So here's my question to all of you. We have three groups, the AAP Bioethics, the AAP Nephrology, and the American Society of Transplant. And my question is, who are the least likely to want to allow a child to donate, and who are the most likely? So we're going to start with the most likely. Who thinks that this are the bi these are the bioethicists? Who thinks that these are the nephrologists? Who thinks these are the surgeons? Yeah, well, you're all wrong. It's the ethicists who wanted to allow it. So now I got data that made absolutely no sense to me, right? I'm sitting there saying, I don't want to allow children to serve as living donors. What's going on? Um, and we never actually, because it was a small study, we really don't know what's going on. I, I, I came up with a story, at least, which is that the pediatric bioethicists think about things from a family perspective. And so they were thinking about all the harms that would happen if a child wasn't allowed to donate and that the other child did poorly on dialysis. Um, but I'm making that up. I have no reason to suspect that. I want to point out that the surgeons were the least likely. And when you think about it, it makes the most sense. They're the ones who are worried about the risk. If anything goes bad, when you're taking out a kidney from a pediatric donor, I mean, it's, a, it's on your conscience. And so it makes total sense that they were the most conservative. I want you to know that when I'm in a pediatric audience, they know that the Greys are the pediatric bioethicists. So it was fascinating in this room that all of you uh, gave the pediatric bioethicists uh, that they were more concerned about risk than they really were. Um, so are twins different, right? So the overall data showed about a 10% difference between all respondents. But anyway, it was this data, actually, that helped us convince the AAP Board of Directors that we were not going to make an exception for the identical twins. And so the policy came out. Um, saying that uh, living donors should, o uh, pediatric living donors should always be the exception, um, regardless of uh, histocompatibility. Uh, and so now, looking back uh, at the study, the donation by a minor is contrary to the recommendations from uh, the U.S. Live Organ Donor Consensus Group, as well as from our AAP statement. Um, and you know, even though I'm showing how many said yes and showing it between 30 and 45 percent, that does mean that over half thought that children should never serve as living donors. So to just conclude, um, well, I've actually made many of these conclusions, so I'm just going to skip to my uh, final slide, which is just to say I want to thank my colleagues who worked with me on all of these projects. Some of them are going to be presented. Uh, the pediatric uh, donor information is going to be presented at the AST in May. And thanks again to Chris, Will, and Dick Thistlethwaite. Uh, Dr. Ross's paper is open for questions far. Lady, in the very first section, you just talked about the unintended consequences of being less for the donors. It seemed like late there is a the question of whether, although we traditionally think of donation, living donation, as supererogatory, not, not something that I was thinking about in the obligation, whether it would make sense for parents that we would think of them as having some obligation if they're compatible with donating. I, th I think all the parents would agree with you, and what they're thinking to themselves is, I'm going to be the retransplant, right? That kidney is not going to last my child's life. And while they can get priority for the best deceased donor, I should take advantage of that so that my kidney is ready when my kid needs it. So I don't think that they're, in a sense, reneging on their obligation. I think they're deferring their obligation to a time when their kid really needs it. They're making good jobs in giving the options where they have. But yes. But it seems like the question that is late there as well as whether it would make sense policy-wise, since many of his organs will last quite a long time. Yeah, but not as long as what a 10-year-old needs. Do you think, so that, you don't think that's ethically? Well, no, I think the real reason I think it's an interesting ethical problem is because the new policy that they're trying to implement is this 2080 rule, where the uh, top 20% of kidneys defined by a kidney donor profile index would go to the top 20% of candidates, mostly defined by age. And so what we're going to see, and I don't have a slide, but if I did, I would show you that about approximately three quarters of all kidney transplants in 18 to 30 year olds come from living donors. And as we start giving them priority for these deceased donors, we're going to see a real drop 
in their receipt of a living uh, donor transplant. And then we're going to get real numbers. Remember, kids make up a small percentage, right? They make up 5% of all the deceased donor recipients and 4% of the living donor recipients. So it's a small number. But as we start including the young adults, I think it may become a bigger problem. And it's one reason to actually oppose the 2080. It's not my main reason. I have lots of reasons for hating the new policy. But it is an unintended consequence that no one's acknowledging. Um, and it's a really important one because UNOS can't control the living donors. And they have to realize that we're talking about almost half of all kidneys are coming from living donors. Very briefly, if you don't do that, Lainey, isn't it the case that people who don't have the bad fortune of not having friends uh, are going to be, they're going to miss out and they otherwise get a lot of utility out of it? It is, and that's why it's not a simple question, but I think at least we have to acknowledge the data, which UNOS has failed to do. And then if they decide to go ahead with that policy, that's fine, but realize the consequences that may result, which is less transplants overall. And since their goal is to maximize graft numbers and graft survival, um, it probably is going against their own goal. So, Lenny, throughout your talk, I was trying to uh, sort out like your perspective on when to favor in some ways the perspective of the individual versus the community perspective. And at times, I had trouble sort of seeing if there was consistency or not. So for example, in the maple syrup uh, example, you talked about uh, even though you might be able to serve more people in the community by having maple syrup uh, folks use dietary therapy, you said you were inclined to say, well, uh, they should have, be able to have transplant if they want. Yet, when you were talking about the on-block example and uh, mentioned that, well, do you divide the kidneys or not, you said, well, um, so the opposite, well, probably we should divide the kidneys and so that even though there's like a 7% less chance of, of survival, um, benefit two people. So this seems kind of a contradictory. So I'm going to start with my bias. I'm a pediatrician and I really care a great deal about kids, right? So you notice I'm giving priority to the maple syrup. I'm not, remember I'm also saying when I think we should be splitting the one to five year old kidneys because children get maximal choice of kidneys under share 35. What I'd really say to them is all one to five year olds should be done as single kidney transplants and surgeons should be thinking about the six to 35 year old kidneys that they want to be putting into their kids. So I'm consistent in that I am totally biased in favor of children. I totally acknowledge that. But again, I'll argue that there's a real need for it in that children uh, do, don't develop and don't grow and do really quite poorly um, um, when they don't have a transplant and they need it. With the maple syrup urine disease, I'm a little more stressed with that because they can do well with dietary, although if they have a decompensation, you know, they, it's irreversible. And so that's really serious and it's really hard to maintain these strict diets. And when kids get sick, um, it gets even harder to really get, uh, to, to avoid a, a metabolic decompensation. So again, this is my pediatric side talking. Nevertheless, so since I'm a pediatrician, and my, my as, so as a pediatrician, I would definitely tell a parent with a child with maple syrup urine disease, go on the liver transplant list. So it's going to require that we have policies that are going to say yes or no, or whether they get highest priority or not get highest priority. Because as a clinician, my obligation is to the patient in front of me, right? As a policy, we need to decide. If we decide we're not going to give deceased donor transplants to anyone who could be treated with dietary therapy, then I'm going to even suggest to the parents to go for a living donor transplant, right? So. I, I'm, so I, I don't think I'm totally inconsistent. One, I'm totally biased in favor of kids. I acknowledge that at the beginning. It's a full disclosure. Um, but second of all, I, I, I do think that as a clinician, we have to focus on our patients, and yet we'll have to accept whatever policies we all agree on. And that's why I'm pointing out some of the intended and unintended consequences of the current policies that exist. So, Lainey, my memory of our data is among the uh, the people electing to have their kids get a disease donor transplant, selecting for kids to have a disease donor transplant first. That's a much stronger, more frequent opinion in the African American community than in the white and Hispanic community when we looked at it by race. Yes. So I'm not sure that the answer you give it answers completely that people are thinking this through. Yeah. So uh, that, Because that should have no uh, racial or ethnic bias. Maybe. Um, so, so Dick's point is, is a totally valid one, which is uh, when we look at um, which parents have become less likely to uh, donate a, a, a living uh, donor transplant, it tends to be more of the African Americans and that the Hispanic and, and whites um, were, were slightly lower, but really minimally so.
Um, and the, the reason it may be is, um, again, when we look at the health issues within the African-American family, where by the time you know, somebody is 45, that you know, the likelihood that they're going to have hypertension or diabetes is, is higher than in the other communities. And so from their own health perspective, it may be that they're, they're thinking, let's see if I can get to 45 and 50 and be healthy enough to give a kidney. Yeah, that existed before also, though. Second thing is that I want to emphasize the potential unintended consequence of the new system where you identify by who are the best 20% of recipients and give them the best 20% of kidneys. Because there are four things that decide who's the, in the best 20% of recipients, and not having a prior kidney transplant is one of those. So someone who gets a living donor kidney transplant as an infant needs another one when they're 20 years old isn't going to get one of those really good kidneys. So they're going to be excluded. So I think that's an even So another more, reason for another, parents another to more. defer, in a sense, to let their kid get the deceased donor kidney when they do have priority. So the third thing I wanted to ask you as a pediatrician is that we know lesser degrees of renal failure, not requiring dialysis, uh, not, when you're not eligible because of a low GFR even for a preemptive transplant, uh, do cause growth retardation, uh, cause uh, uh, delay in uh, cognitive uh, function. Uh, uh, are these, should, should we actually preemptively be transplanting kids who have diseases we know are going to cause chronic renal failure, but early in the course of their disease? Wow. Um, tough question. Um, I, I guess I would let the parents make that decision, right? And I would bet that would lead to a lot more uh, living donors for, for those children who have those uh, kidney conditions, which are going to be a slow decline and yet um, eventually lead to kidney failure. I would bet they would go preemptive. Eleni, you showed us those curves on um, survival of organs by different age groups of the donors. Do you know if there are parallel curves in, in for example, liver transplant? Or, or would the liver transplant situation show different kinds of results? You're going to have to wait till the end of this summer, since we'll have a student doing some of those projects this summer. So you, you, I don't know. I'm don't sure there it. are, but mm -hmm. I, I don't work. I, I specialize, Mark. <laughs> I'm just curious in the calculations about um, maple sugar urine disease with and without transplantation, how far out did the consideration of benefit go? So, for uh, so example, not long. did it consider the noncompliance of adolescents with immunosuppression and the long-term consequences of immunosuppression and the possibility of having to be retransplanted at some time? So since we've only started doing it in the last five to seven years, we don't have any long-term mm -hmm. data. But clearly, those are issues. Um, the, the group that um, who have been, in a sense, at the forefront of this is the Amish community. Um, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where the, the uh, special, uh, the uh, clinic for special something um, is. And, um, you know, th th those parents and that family, th that is a very tight knit community, so that might not even help us in long term data about compliance or anything else. So, but it's a very, it's a totally reasonable point to be determined. You have the same non compliance with dietary control when kids actually got to that age. And, and again, it, with the dietary lack of control leading to a metabolic decompensation that's irreversible. Laney, what's the interaction of um, recipient age and uh, donor age if the donor kidneys are very young? Do they? Uh, I, they not, do well. They, they do well if they get through the early period. Exactly. Yeah, that was all, but we actually did divide it by age, and people do well. So okay. it really is, I mean, there's probably some cutoff. Um, the, the one study that I pointed out looked and said it was something around 9 or 10 kilos worth of kidney is what you need. Will actually did an analysis of their looking at the recipient age, and it was not a problem. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.